tend to be Where the light and darkness meet On the edge of the horizon Through the trees I am a narcissist Crippled with self-doubt I've got a courage That brings me to my knees Hi, hello, howdy How are you all doing today? Um, I certainly hope you're all doing great today And I hope you had a wonderful Halloween Today is actually Halloween or tonight um, so please excuse the fact that I look like death warmed over, but I just got back from taking my grandkids, um, trick-or-treating, and we were on the buggy, so, yeah, I live in Florida, humidity. But, either way, thank you all for, for being here. Um, this, the story that I'm going to tell this evening is a request, and I was asked not to give the person's name who made the request, and I will honor that. But thank you for the suggestion if you're watching. Um, this story is absolutely unimaginable. Um, this is proof. This story right here is absolute proof that there is evil in this world. If you get anything out of this video, though, please take a moment and like and subscribe. And if you have any case suggestions, please let me know. If you don't want your name said, just let me know that also. Now let's jump into the case of Dakota Collins. Dakota Hayden Collins was born in 2008 to Robin Collins and Al Mutenhan McLean. We're going to call him McLean through the video. Dakota was born in Wisconsin. Um, both of Dakota's parents were addicts. A friend of Robin's named Anita Bredenson spoke out after the death of Dakota. She claimed that Robin was unable to care for Dakota, so she took him in, and Robin and her boyfriend would visit Dakota in the home Anita shared with her fiancé, Brian. She went on to say that at one of the visits, Robin's boyfriend hit Dakota and CPS got involved and he was placed in foster care. Okay, I'm fixing to put a document up on the screen um, that shows that wasn't what happened. Um, because I continue to, I've watched several videos on this and even TikToks, and they're all blaming the boyfriend when in fact Robin hit Dakota. He was 11 months old. She admitted to it. Um, she said that she needed somebody to take him. She just didn't want him anymore. But she she's the one that beat Dakota at 11 months old. I'm also sure that many of y'all will disagree with me on this, but I'm sorry. It's the way I feel. Um, there was a lawsuit, and $3.3 million um, was paid due to the negligence of CPS and, and really law enforcement, too. And, well, everybody involved. The exact amount that went to each person involved is was not disclosed. Um, I do not know. But it did say that the majority of it went to his three living siblings, which is fair. But the remainder of it went to the grandmother and the mother. So Robin also received money, and I just don't think it's right. Um, Yes, she did call CPS and, and 911, and her she was rather ignored because nothing was done. She did say she felt so guilty about what happened when he was 11 months old, but I just don't think I'd have been able to accept the money. But then again, I don't think I would have been able to beat an 11-month-old baby to know. So back to Dakota's story. At 11 months old, Dakota was taken into CPS custody, and for the next few years, he was placed into three different foster homes. Now, per Anita, Robin's friend, during this time, McLean had nothing to do with Dakota. He never called to check on him. He never saw him. Well, CPS did locate uh, McLean and let him know what was happening with Dakota. Big mistake. Dakota was placed back with Anita and her fiancé, and her fiancé began the procedure of adoption for Dakota. McLean pops up in Wisconsin around this time and did a DNA test to prove paternity as Dakota's father, and he took custody. Anita said, quote, They took Dakota from my fiancé and gave him to a complete stranger, unquote, which he was. She went on to say that from the day of the spanking that put Dakota into foster care, her fiancé, Brian, fought to get custody of Dakota to give him a stable and loving home. The last time Anita and Brian saw Dakota, however, was at his fourth birthday party. 
She said she now just wants people to know that at one time Dakota was loved and he was a happy child, even when he was in foster care. Now, I can't understand for the life of me how McLean ever received custody of Dakota or any child for that matter. Because that was like red flags and they were flying high and they were flying all over the place. There was just no hiding that he was a very violent man. In 2012, on April the 5th, while in Wisconsin, McLean thought a man had his phone. He then choked this man and beat the man quite badly. Um, it turned out the man didn't even have McLean's phone, but it didn't stop McLean. He pled guilty to disorderly in conduct, which I don't understand how was, you know, the, how they worked that plea, because choking would at least be aggravated battery on a felony level, or it actually could be a, attempted murder because it is. But according to Robin, on the 21st of October in 2013, Robin filed a petition with the court and begged them not to let McLean take Dakota and leave the state. She claimed that his treatment of Dakota was already under investigation by Child Welfare Services in Wisconsin. Now, ch Child Welfare um, could neither deny or confirm this as Dakota was a minor and there's privacy laws. Well, her request fell on deaf ears as on the 23rd of October in 2013, McLean was given permanent and sole custody of Dakota after only having temporary custody since July. Only three days after he was awarded custody, the 26th of October in 2013, uh, McLean was arrested and charged with hitting his fiance. Amanda Hines, who we will discuss later in this story, but he hit her over the head with a pipe and drug her by her hair to the car, punched her several times, and then drove away with her in Wisconsin. The charges were dropped, however, as Amanda refused to testify against him. Okay, as if this situation wasn't already a ticking time bomb and very volatile, Amanda now brought her sister, Jennifer, with them, who she claimed to be mentally disabled. I question the degree of real understanding Jennifer had, but we'll get back to that. I just, I don't, I do understand that there are people that don't comprehend, and I totally get that, and no shame to them whatsoever, but in this case, I'm sorry, I have some questions, but we will get back to that. In February of 2014, on the 26th, Collins again wrote the court to let them know that McLean took Dakota and moved to Union City, which is in Tennessee. She said McLean just ripped him out of school and left. She further said that with CPS not involved now, she doesn't even know if he's okay. He moved back to Wisconsin with Amanda, Jennifer, and Dakota in tow but was only there for a very short time. Um, moving ahead to June the 30th in 2014, McLean filed with the Wisconsin courts that he intended to move with Dakota to Pennsylvania. He had a letter with him that had been signed by Robin and was notarized, but a few days later, um, she again wrote a letter to the courts, and that she said that she was threatened and that she had been forced to sign this letter. Also, McLean lied as he didn't actually move to Pennsylvania. He moved to Dayton, Ohio. This story is really all over the place. It really is. Um, unfortunately, allegations were made that Dakota was being abused during this time, but again, um, nothing was done. It was said that child services had an overflow of child abuse allegations and that Dakota got lost in the shuffle. And I do understand that it's a stressful job. There's no way that it's not. And I understand that many of the caseworkers are have very heavy caseloads and they're overworked, but I am sorry, um, there is no excuse. This is not the kind of job that you can let someone just get lost in any kind of shuffle. Children's lives are depending on these workers to do their job. 
And in too many of these cases, they didn't. They just, they didn't. And that is, it's just beyond me. I, I don't comprehend it. But anyways, the exact date um, that Dakota was enrolled into school is not known. But he was enrolled into Horace Mann Elementary School in Dayton, Ohio. Um, they, the school officials could not confirm the exact date, but it was in 2014. The school year at Horace Mann, however, started on the 18th of August. Dakota's teachers actually spoke very highly of Dakota. They said that he was a very sweet little boy who came from a very bad situation. They also said that Dakota was often dirty and in clothes that smelled of urine and feces. Every morning, his teachers would wash out his clothes and clean him up when he arrived at school. McLean couldn't stand that somebody was showing Dakota kindness. He actually showed up at the school and began yelling at the staff that they were never to do that again. They could not continue showing this extended kindness to Dakota and they were to never clean him up again. McLean even gave Dakota bad haircuts so that the other children would make fun of him. The school made 17 calls um, to child services to tell them that Dakota was being severely abused and clearly he needed help. Um, well, instead of help, this made Dakota's life even worse. As to avoid getting caught abusing Dakota, McLean pulled him out of school with the claim that he would be homeschooled. No one was there now to question, and now Dakota was just hidden away from anyone who could see the damage that was being done to Dakota's little body. The abuse only got worse now. Um, McLean had no concerns of getting caught, so he could just do whatever he wanted to this child. So McLean's fiance, Amanda Hines, bought a house on Kensington Drive in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, though this relationship was so volatile, to say the very least, uh, McLean and Dakota lived there with Amanda, along with Amanda's sister, Jennifer. Then, on the 19th of February in 2016, Child Services contacted the police in Dayton, Ohio, and asked for a well check on Dakota due to the suspicion of child abuse. When no one answered the door, um, they just left, and they did not return to check on him. How? How does this keep happening? On the 6th of March, also in 2016, Amanda contacted the police in Dayton and said that McLean was drunk and that she asked him to leave and he refused. The police report stated that when they arrived at the home, McLean was indeed drunk and being argumentative, yet they didn't do anything other than advise um, Amanda of the process to evict McLean, which she did not do. And I wish that I could say that the case was that she was staying, um, let him stay so she could somewhat watch over Dakota and try to protect him, but that wasn't it. That was not it at all. That is not what her selfish behind was doing, I can assure you. On the 25th of May, Amanda called the law again, and she was crying and said that McLean had hit her and that he again refuses to leave. The police were dispatched to the residence, but Amanda chose not to press charges, and again, nothing was done. During this time, McLean and Amanda also got a, another of McLean's sons. Um, the details of why or how are not known. But Amanda called the law again on the 9th of June and said that a neighbor was drunk and threatened to kill her. When the police showed up, um, both the neighbor and McLean were intoxicated and they were fighting, the police, however, left without filing any charges again. Then on the 26th of July, a call was made to 911 from the Kensington Drive address where the family was living in Dayton, Ohio. Um, the caller only gave the name out and kept disconnecting the call and then calling back. And he was claiming that he had been hit by a woman, yet another incident ending with no arrest. Um, it seems like by now, wouldn't the police be tired of this? Then on the 2nd of August, uh, McLean was served with an order of protection from a woman he met locally who claimed that he assaulted her. This order was dismissed also as the incident did not meet the requirements for the protection order. 
But how many red flags and um, signs are needed that this man has issues with violence? How did he just continue to get away with this over and over and over and so many reports to child services and the police visiting the home and never checking on Dakota? And not only that, but during this time, he also got custody of his older son, but it's questionable how. But he also got his little brother. So not only does he keep getting these calls, but he keeps getting more kids. I don't understand. I don't get it. I just, I don't get it. On the 20th of August, Dakota's older brother, though, he ran away. And when the police found him, he told them that he was forced to do squats while holding heavy book bags as punishment. A referral was made to child services again. The police arrived and they planned to attempt to search the home, but McLean had pit bulls so the police couldn't access the property. Okay, they've got one child claiming to be abused. They know there's other kids in the home. Why didn't they tell him to put the, bull, the pit bulls up and check on the kids? I do not understand this, but... While there, they noticed that there were cameras on the outside of the home. McLean told them that the cameras were only for show and had no capability to record. Yet, on the 14th of September, McLean called 911 and reported that someone broke into his home and made threats towards his family while pointing a gun at him. Also not a safe environment for children. But he provided the police with a video of the incident, which was captured by the cameras that he claimed didn't have the capability to record. Well, apparently they work when he needed them. Dakota's older brother, though, was sent to live with his mother at the time. At this time, Dakota's bedroom was the attic. Um, McLean made the attic less of a room and more of a hideaway prison for Dakota. However. He installed cameras, and he, Amanda, and Jennifer would sit in the living room and monitor the cameras and wait for him to do anything that they viewed as wrong so McLean could head upstairs and just keep continuously cause more injuries with his abuse to this poor child. Dakota became so desperate for help, he jumped out of a very small window in the attic. And somehow at this time, he, he was taken to the hospital as he broke his leg. Um, but instead of saying this is a cry for help, that he decided he had behavioral problems. Dakota actually told the staff at the Dayton Children's Hospital where they were putting the cast on his leg that he was being abused and that he jumped out of the window because he was scared. They witnessed the bruises and the abrasions all over his body. But they believed McLean when he claimed that Dakota had these behavioral problems and was causing these injuries to himself. Y'all, Dakota was only nine years old at this time and clearly begging for help from anybody. But he was not only ignored, but he was being blamed for the abuse by people that should have been helping him. Um, the hospital released him back to McLean without calling the law, child services, or anybody, which probably wouldn't even have helped him because of Dakota's history as any indication. Um, nobody is helping. I don't understand. Gosh, I can't understand this, but the abuse only got worse at this point. McLean put up drywall to make Dakota's room smaller. He now had no window, which means he had no light. McLean said he didn't deserve the comfort of a mattress, so he took it away from him. He only gave Dakota a tarp on the floor, and the only furniture that he had at all was an old worn-out green lawn chair. He was also forced to go without clothes. Um, while being humiliated, because he's left in this little room naked, being watched on cameras by not just McLean, but Amanda and Jennifer, and they were feeding off the abuse that McLean was doing, like it was quality entertainment. 
because every time they seen anything they thought was wrong, they ran to McLean to tell him. So though Robin was supposed to have visitation um, with Dakota, it was about four years before she even heard his voice. And when she did, she called the law and asked them to please check on Dakota. Uh, she, when she finally got to hear his voice, she could tell that he was scared. Um, she talked to him on the phone. She said that he not only sounded scared, he sounded like he was in pain and that it was obvious McLean was right there telling him what to say. McLean then took the phone and was bragging to Robin that he would beat Dakota with belts and other objects. The police went back to the home and they did not see Dakota because nobody answered the door. So they left and they did not go back. Y'all, what is going on in Dayton, Ohio? I mean, is there not a mandatory procedure when it comes to checking on kids? Should you not see the kids? I don't, oh, for the life of me, I don't understand. I don't, I just don't understand it. For the next two years, Dakota remained alone to suffer the abuse of the three monsters that should have cared for him. I don't even understand why they went and got him. I don't for the life of me. This was now a daily thing, and most of the time, it was multiple times a day. He remained in this closed-off, dark area of the attic. At the bottom of the stairs to this attic was a door that McLean had added a padlock to to make sure he had no way out. With only the tarp to sleep on, Dakota wasn't permitted sheets, blankets, a pillow, and most of the time, he wasn't permitted clothes, as punishment on top of the many beatings, and by beatings, McLean, right after saying he loved his son and only wanted to protect him from hurting himself, he admitted that he often would punch Dakota and would drag him up and down the stairs. And when he was allowed a bath, he would only allow him cold water. And many times, McLean would hit him and dunk his head under the water. And on top of this, Dakota was made to remain in what McLean, Amanda, and Jennifer all referred to as a punishment position for sometimes 20 hours. He would have to cross his legs, and with his legs crossed, he would have to bend over, and it's sometimes his hands behind his head, and sometimes he would have to put them out to the side. When Amanda went to work, Jennifer was then in charge of watching the cameras to make sure that Dakota remained that way. In a police interrogation with Jennifer, she told the detective that sometimes when Amanda would come in from work, she would tell Dakota to go to bed, but only allow him to sleep until McLean got home, which was usually within two hours, and he would have to get back up into that same position in front of the camera with no clothes on or nothing. Jennifer also said that she would feed him when he was actually given food by putting it, putting food into a bowl and sitting it on the bottom step. Now, in the interrogation, the officer was like, so what was he fed? And she actually said, he's fed good. I feed him the same thing I feed my dog. But she would sit, sit the bowl on the bottom step and she would yell for Dakota to come down and get it. Well, Dakota was forbidden from touching anything as, and this is a quote from Jennifer, you know, the one who they claim is um, mentally handicapped. But I believe she knew exactly what she was doing, and she was just as evil. But anyway, she said, quote, He stunk up everything he touched, so we didn't want him touching anything. Unquote. Dakota had became so weak by now that he had lost his balance. And But if he swayed and touched the wall, Jennifer would go tell McLean and he would be punished. She also told the detective that she took him down to the bathroom and told him to pull down his shorts and go to the bathroom, but reminded him that he was dirty so he was not allowed to touch the toilet seat. Remember, by this time... Dakota is so weak, he can barely stand. How are there people like this? How? Anyways, 
The detective pointed out to Jennifer that she was under the impression Dakota wasn't allowed clothes and asked where the shorts were from, and she responded that at times McLean let him and waited for him to soil them so he could make them wear them on his head. Now, we are talking about a child who has spent his life alone and abused. He's now kept locked in an attic and abused daily. He, he is at the mercy of these evil people that are so-called parents when it comes to using a bathroom. So he would go on the floor. McLean would beat him for this and then make him eat it as punishment. He also would whip him with objects and punch him. And Dakota became scared at this point. And he would hold it as long as he could. And when he couldn't hold it anymore, he would go in the floor again. And then he started eating it on his own to try not to get caught. Now keep in mind that while he was locked in this attic and he was suffering such extreme abuse from McLean, um, Amanda and Jennifer were egging it on by pointing out any infraction, rather real or imaginary. Amanda and Jennifer watched all that happened to this child and never once tried to save him. Um, McLean then takes a shock collar off one of his pit bulls and he puts it on Dakota and also began using a taser on this child. So in an interrogation, Jennifer told the investigator that at times she wanted to call for help, but she wasn't allowed to have a phone or use the internet, as Amanda and McLean said she talked too much and she couldn't keep secrets. Moving ahead to the 13th day of December in 2019, Dakota started that day as he always did alone in an attic being forced to stand in the what they called the punishment position for several hours while being forced to hold a heavy bag while he is so weak already from lack of food he was told to come down to the door and when he didn't move at a speed that mclean found acceptable mclean ran up and grabbed dakota by the ears and drug him down the stairs when he got him down the stairs, um, that by now from this being done so many times has blood all over them, both old and new, but he drug Dakota into the bathroom. Once in the bathroom, McLean ordered Dakota to bend over into the punishment position and McLean poured hot sauce on Dakota's anus. He claimed to the detective in the interrogation that he believed Dakota had been inserting items in his rectum and he did this to stop him so he, quote, wouldn't hurt himself, unquote. He furthered this ridiculous statement with when he was young, he would stick his fingers in his mouth and his father put hot sauce on his fingers to stop him and it worked. He told the investigator that Dakota still wasn't moving fast enough, so he threatened Dakota that he would drown him if he did not pick up the pace. Both Amanda and Jennifer admitted to hearing this said by McLean and then hearing splashing and choking sounds coming from the bathroom, yet neither one of them bothered to get off their asses to try to stop him to save this baby's life. Neither thought it would be a good time to call the law, which clearly Amanda knew how to do, judging by the number of calls she'd already called, when she felt like he would hurt her, a grown woman. And she wasn't a little woman. This woman could have defended herself, I guarantee you. But either way, she never thought to call when he was beating a child to death, literally. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that what I've already told if the story has been awful and hard to hear, but I need to warn you now and please heed this warning. This is fixing to get worse. A lot worse. So please continue with caution, please. I'm telling you, this is hard to hear. 
McLean then forced Dakota to get out of the tub and to get back upstairs, and he placed Dakota back into his attic room and on this tarp. McLean then decided the punishment was sufficient, so he went downstairs to sit on the couch with Amanda and Jennifer and relax and watch Dakota suffer alone on the monitor. He saw Dakota move, and this made him angry, so he ran back upstairs, grabbed a leg off of a stool, grabbed Dakota's extremely weak and battered little body, turned him on his stomach, and ran the leg of the stool into the anus of this child. Y'all. He spent the next several minutes ramming this stool leg into his son before getting up and kicking him. Then he stood on top of Dakota's back with his full weight. And at one point, he even put his hands on the ceiling like this to push more weight down on Dakota. Amanda and Jennifer are still watching all of this happen on the monitor and still doing absolutely nothing to stop it. Dakota was then pulled back downstairs and into the bathroom. He was continuously being shocked with the collar that he was forced to wear. He was put back in the tub full of cold water and he was held under the water. He was then taken back out of the tub and forced again to stand in the punishment position for several hours again while being tased and shocked with the shock collar. He was then molested again with the stool leg, drugged back up the stairs, thrown back down the stairs. He was punched, kicked, tortured, and then put back in the water to be held under again. Y'all. We won't go into the things I hope they do to this man in prison. We just won't. At this point, Dakota knew he was dying. He began yelling and begging for help. He was pleading. Neither McLean, Amanda, nor Jennifer made any effort whatsoever to help this baby. None. As a result of being molested with the stool leg, Dakota now had an extremely extended abdomen. His organs were busted, and they were bleeding into his abdominal cavity. While begging for help, Dakota tried to push himself off of the floor, but he was too weak. He fell back on his face. While begging for help, Dakota tried to push himself off the floor, but he was too weak, and he fell back on his face. McLean then grabbed Dakota under his arms and took him down to the cellar. Dakota was put on the floor, naked, cold, swollen, bruised, and cut. His stomach was distended to what was said to be the same in appearance as that of a woman in full-term pregnancy. McLean told the investigator that he was unsure of his son's condition at the time and contemplated calling 911, but wasn't going to let Dakota waste the first responder's time. What the... He decided instead he would put Dakota back into the bathtub for a while, took him out, and laid him behind the couch of the living room. Not on the couch, behind the couch. He then decided that Dakota was really hurt, so he called 911. What a true humanitarian. While on the phone with 911, he took the time to dress Dakota um, with help from Amanda and Jennifer. This was the second time in two years that Dakota was allowed to wear clothes. When the EMTs arrived, McLean actually told them that he had attempted CPR, but the smell from Dakota's mouth was so horrid as he liked to eat feces. The man isn't even human, guys. This man is not human. It was confirmed, however, by the dispatcher that McLean attempted CPR as he was heard making gagging sounds while attempting the CPR. Dakota was rushed to the Dayton Children's Hospital, but Dakota's little body could not take any more. Dakota was pronounced dead. So McLean, Amanda, and Jennifer were taken to the sheriff's office under investigation and to be interrogated. 
The first thing that McLean uh, said was to complain he was hit in the mouth by an officer who accused him of killing his son. Now, I do not agree with police brutality, but yeah, good job. I'm afraid for my life. Yeah, I'm hurt that my child is gone. It's unbelievable. Like, I, I still don't believe right now he's dead, gone, not coming back. You're afraid for your life? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I'll be spending the rest of my life in prison. I'm 30 years old. What I'm going to do for the rest of my life, but all because I tried to raise my child the right way and he became defiant. Okay, go ahead and up. Put your hands around your back. We're going to take you to the valley, put your church out, all right? Can you tell me what I'm being charged with? Right now, murder and child endangering. Murder? Yes. What does the, what does murder mean? Like, I, Murder I, means you killed your child. I so planned means, it. What's that? That means I planned it or something? No, I didn't say you planned it. What I'm saying is that you murdered your son. Good job. He then began telling them that he was only interested in learning what happened to his son. He then began complaining and blaming Dakota for his own death. Because just when I thought that this son of a bitch couldn't be any less human, in my opinion, he became less human. Through the interrogation, he continuously told the investigators that he hadn't slept in three days. And I have no idea why he thinks that that would make anything he did okay. He then told her that this kid, and by the way, that's what he kept calling Dakota, this kid. But this kid kept falling downstairs and knocking his head around. He then pointed out that Dakota appeared to have something wrong with his stomach, so he made him drink a lot of water as it was common for him to eat his own feces. And he wanted him to throw it up. And he's very obviously trying to cover up what he did to Dakota. I'm going to add part of each defendant's interrogation. I would add it all, but this video would be several hours long. This photo would be laying on the floor. His backside would be to the railing area, and then I would go upstairs and just and dump the hot sauce all over him on the floor and everything. I can burn his little stars. He was in that room downstairs. And then he was misbehaving because he was pooping everywhere. He could choose the bathroom any time, whatever, you know, like a normal child. But he would refuse to use the bathroom and use that himself every night and everything. And so then he started, first he started spanking him, doing, putting him in the corner. Then it escalated from there. He would start doing a little more punching him and just kicking him, still punching him, kicking him, elbowing him in the gut, smacking him across the head and everything. And then, then we got this metal spatula down or whatever that he used to beat him with it. And then this morning, he, I called him down for breakfast. He wouldn't come. He, I called him down. Kept on calling him down. Finally, he came down, and then I woke up Al, and he was sitting. Dakota was sitting on the toilet, and he elbowed him in the back, and then he fell to the floor, and then he made him lay on his stomach, hands behind the back, and he stepped on it. It was going on for thirty years. I should have done something. All I know is that Amanda never laid any hands on him. I mean, she would spank him and just tell him not to do things, tell him to do things, but he would never listen. So we both told Al that he, that he wouldn't listen, and then Al would go be on it. I got woken up by Amanda crying and freaking out. And then we, and that's when we left. Because Dakota was a breather. He was in that one room off the bathroom area when I moved down, when we, whatever, and then he just 
stunk up the whole downstairs. So he, that's when he, they moved him off the dining room area. And that one room that I'm at now. In the back. Yeah. Okay. Back, they moved him back there. And then the, it just started stinking up Amanda's room because it's right off her room too. So then they moved him down in the basement in that because there's a back room like if you turn left down there there's a room right there and then he just got tired of going like I don't know what changed about him being down there and then they put him back in that back room and bought the dining room area and then they put him back in that um room off the bathroom and then then they put him upstairs because that's when I they talked to me I mean he is a good father he won't intentionally do it but he's but Dakota was just so out of control he just couldn't do much to they want, needed help for him and everything they just never really got any help from him always that he would just go all crazy on him pouring on him when he's on the stairs upstairs he'd go upstairs and just yeah. For the hot sauce on him mm-hmm. to make him burn, and that's what he said, to make him burn. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get up and show you stuff that Dakota's okay. supposed to do. So he's supposed to stand like this, with his, sometimes hands behind his head, sometimes behind his back. So if he goes like this, or like just uncrosses him, and freaks out. And then he's, I know this is going to be weird, but he's, I'm going to, Another thing, he's supposed to go like this, and then he's supposed to bend over, um, just like this, and then have his hands spread out like that. So, yeah, and if he's not doing that, I have to tell Al, and that's like all the time while he's up there, so he's not touching anything. Yeah. So for like hours, he's supposed to be doing that. Until seven in the morning, till about sometimes three, four in the morning. Did you guys talk at all before you left? Mm-mm. I just said I gotta run to the bank. I'll be back. He didn't even answer the phone. I was trying to call him. I mean, just kind of tell me about him. I don't know anything about him. Mm-hmm. Well, when we first got together, he was fighting for custody of him in Wisconsin. Um, that's how we met. Uh, he got overnight business with him, and, and he was a good kid. Um, he bounced around foster home, foster home. Um, then after probably a few years after we got custody we moved here in 2014. He went to school at uh, Horace Mann. He had a lot of behavior problems. Uh, he was going to get kicked out of school. So we just decided to homeschool him to see if that would work. Hurt me at the knife one time so I took all the knives away. And I just put them in my daughter's room. You didn't really see Dakota this morning. Mm-mm, I barely ever see him. Like I said, I, by the time I get up there. So where does he go to school now? He's homeschooled. By who? Me. So he was in foster care. Why was he in foster care? His mother put him in foster care. Okay. And so you guys got him out of foster care. Mm-hmm. When was the last time he went to school? This is his second year being homeschooled. So Josiah, who who's who is whose baby is Josiah? It's Al's brother. His it's, mom's baby. Yes. Or his dad's. His mom's. I don't think they know their fathers. How do you guys have him? Uh she left him with us and we were just taking care of him. I haven't talked to her in a while. She's I don't know if she's in jail or, or what. So where does everybody in the house like where do they sleep? Well, Al and I have our bedroom. And he sometimes sleeps in our room, either with us or on the floor, or on the couch. Just varies. Uh, then there's a bedroom across from us, which is where it's full of sleeps at. And then my sister, we kind of made her a bedroom in the back of the house. It's kind okay, of the so I mean, us. Dakota stays in the bedroom across from mine. Okay, Josiah doesn't stay in there at all? He naps in there. Okay. So you get up about one, and your sister's where? She's in her room. So you could go get her and say, hey, we got to run to the store? Mm-hmm. I always take her. I don't like driving alone.
But Al was sitting on the couch. Mm-hmm. Okay. Explain to me what all these marks are on Takoda. What marks? The marks all over his body. From jumping out the window or what? No. I don't look at her. These marks on his body. I don't use a pen. I don't look at his body. So I have no idea. Somebody said that you said Josiah was visiting from Tennessee. Yeah, his mom's supposed to be getting him back, but he, she hasn't gotten a hold of us. So We've just been taking care of him. For how long? Um, since April. Like marks on his face, you didn't? You never noticed the marks on his face? I didn't see him this morning. I haven't seen him. Or maybe this big cut that's on his, ink, like around his foot? Mm -hmm. You never noticed that? Mm -mm. When was the last time you saw him? Probably last week or so. I've been working six days a week trying to get some extra money for the holidays. Okay, well, there's still a day left. I know, I usually. So, what do you do on that day? I just head off today and yesterday. Okay. In the house, bedroom, watching TV, I don't know. She's usually around with his dad. His dad goes to his friend's house a lot. What friend's house? I don't know his name. Let's not play stupid, okay? Because I, I really don't have a lot of tolerance for stupid. You know what I mean? Especially when it comes to a kid that lost his life. So this is your chance to explain this to us because you're not stupid, okay? You can kind of play like you are, but you're not stupid. So let's discuss how this happened to him. I, I don't you do know. this to him? Did no. you do this to him? No. I Were you beaten on? No. Okay, who was? I don't know. I, I wasn't you there. You do know. I wasn't there. Come on. But you're still not stupid. I didn't, never touched him. I never surrounded him. I thought you homeschooled him. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't talk to him? Barely ever. You never noticed that this kid was probably miserable his entire 10 years, or at least the time that this has been going on, because this didn't just happen. What monster does this? Are you a monster? No. Oh, well then tell me how this happened. I don't know. He's usually wearing clothes when I'm around him. I don't okay, know but they were on his arms, on his hands. His face had cuts. I didn't see him today. I don't know. I, they weren't from today. They were from a period of time, not just today. What clothes does he wear? He had jeans and khaki pants and t-shirts. I had to throw 99% of them out. What did he have left? He only had a couple of pairs left until where, I got where them more. They? they were in his room. And the room where all the toddler clothes were? Yes. Last That's time I checked, the other toddler size. I kept all the clothes there. But 90% of them had to yeah, There might have been clothes up in the upstairs. So who goes in the upstairs? No, we leave it locked. Because it leaks. Well, it's off limits. So why is there urine and stuff up there? Our dogs go up there sometimes. Do they pee in buckets? You guys should train your dog to pee in buckets? There's no buckets up there. Yeah, there's, there's buckets a swimming urine pool. in there. There shouldn't be no buckets in there. The ceiling leaks. I well, the buckets are leak. So the dogs hang out up in the attic? Sometimes they go up there. Because they don't get along, so we have to bring another dog in. If we bring the outside dogs in, my other dog has to go upstairs or in the basement. So let's get back to this. So today, a 10 year old who is going to be 11 very soon, is that correct? Baby. Um, lost his life somehow and has marks all over him that couldn't be self-inflicted. So I'd like to know how that happened. Okay, so all three of these monsters were charged and kept in jail while awaiting trial. Judge J. Dennis Atkins of the Montgomery County Common Pleas Court was over the trials and the sentencing. 
He followed the recommendation of the prosecutors. Judge Atkins told McLean that this was the most horrific case of abuse and torture that this court has ever seen. He said it's not just a murder, it's torture. He further told McLean that he showed Dakota no mercy and he deserved no mercy from the court. And ladies and gentlemen, I agree. He doesn't deserve mercy from anyone. McLean pled guilty to murder, rape, kidnapping, and child endangerment. He was sentenced to spend 51 years to life in prison. Judge Atkins further ruled that um, if released from prison, he'll have to register as a Tier 3 sex offender as well as a violent offender. And in my honest opinion, that's just not nearly enough. McLean now sits in the Toledo Correctional Institution, inmate number A-795165. He will become parole eligible on the 30th of November in 2070. Amanda took a plea bargain. She pled guilty to endangering a child, and for this charge, she received a minimum of eight years. Involuntary manslaughter, which she received a minimum of 11 years and a maximum of 24.5 years, and endangering a child in which she received three years for. She was transferred to the Dayton Correctional Institution, and her inmate number is W108143. Her expected release date or parole eligibility date is the 10th of December in 2041. I listened to several phone calls that were made from Amanda to her mother, and though she claimed to the court that she had remorse, from those calls, I call bullshit. Sorry. Uh, there's many of these calls, and they are long, but if you're interested, they're easy to find on YouTube. Jennifer pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter, which she received three years for, and endangering a child, which she received a minimum of eight years and a maximum of 12 years for. She is held at the Ohio Reformatory for Women, and her inmate number is W108142. Her expected release or parole eligibility date is the 17th of December in 2027. Now, she did talk to the investigators and told them what happened, but she started that conversation with Amanda said, we are all going to go down for this, and I'm not going down for it. So I really believe that her motive was selfish. It wasn't guilt. It was looking out for herself. Dakota's death has led to a number of changes at a local level and to the introduction of state legislation. There's been a 30% increase in the number of cases referred from Children's Services to the prosecutor's office. Dayton Police also changed how it conducts children welfare checks, and Ohio Representative Phil Plummer introduced a bill that seeks to reform the way county services operate. They need it. The bill has passed the House and remains in a Senate committee, but it's so sad to me that it took what happened to this innocent child to bring attention to there being a problem. I also hope that the hospital changes its procedure and automatically contacts Children's Services and law enforcement when a child tells them they're being abused. I mean, that one really baffled me because a doctor could see all those injuries and just Oh, you did it yourself. How? <sighs> well, ladies and gentlemen, um, this brings us to the end of the tragic story of Dakota Collins. And all I can say at this point is I hope and pray that he is now at peace. And I sincerely hope that he never leaves the minds of the people who hurt him or the people who failed him so bad. Rest easy, baby boy, please. Just rest easy. If you stayed until the end of Dakota's story, thank you so much. I know this one was hard to hear. Um, please leave me your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you feel that I told the story with respect for Dakota and would like to watch the stories that I post in the future, please hit the like button and the subscribe button. And until the next video, toodles. I am equal parts. Oh.